I hope you guys are all doing well at home all by yourselves or with your families right now. I know this is a weird, stressful time, but hopefully podcasts can keep you a little bit distracted. And I tried to make this one as relevant as possible. Again, we're not, <laughs> we're not really digging into the issues here, but it is an issue I think a lot of us are facing right now. How to do things like live streaming really well. I have never seen more people creating live streams on their Instagram. So like my IGTV, I was just, or sorry, my Instagram feed, I was just looking at it a minute ago. And the whole top bar, instead of seeing stories, it was all live feeds. But here's what I've seen be a bit of the problem so far is people are just turning it on without a lot of consideration about how to do it well or if you're actually providing value for the people that are watching. I find live hard to do as well. Like I think it's great. I think there's a lot of use cases for it, but it's not always, it doesn't make sense for everything. Um, and if this reminds me, I was reading this funny article. It's not a funny article. It's a funny idea in a, in a Verge article just before this, talking about how this is the first time that the whole planet is using all of these social media platforms exactly as the companies intended. Um, so like every single feature is being really pushed to the max. But at the same time, you know, things to be aware of right now. And uh, let me check the date to make sure this is current. Uh, it is currently March 24th. I know things are moving quickly. Uh, just today, you know, uh, YouTube was announcing that they would be downgrading the default quality from 1080p to 480, that's standard def, um, just to sort of conserve bandwidth. I know this is happening in other countries like Italy as well. Uh, Netflix had already scaled back its quality because so many people are online right now. Um, and you know, I, I think we can expect a little bit more of this. There'll, there'll be need to be room made for the huge influx of people that are online every day. Um, so something we get into a little bit in this episode that I, I think is really the most interesting and important point is that this is a time to get to know your technology better than you ever have before. Uh, Alex Lindsay, our great guest today, makes the analogy of that it's like, you know, knowing how to dress for a business meeting. You show up in a suit and a tie. And if you're the one guy that doesn't have a suit, you're, you're probably not going to be treated the same as everybody else. That's what's happening with technology right now. If your lens is blurry when you do Instagram stories, if you are sitting in a dark, if you're the only one in a dark room in your Zoom meetings, you're going to look unprofessional. This is suddenly more important than ever. So I think all at once, everybody needs to really get a grip on this stuff, even if it was a challenge before. Alex Lindsley is somebody I've been following for over a decade now. I've always appreciated his insights on Mac Break Weekly. If you haven't seen him before, he does really high-end video production and streaming and stuff. So he is an expert in this field. I hope you guys enjoy the show. And by the way, if you are watching this video right now, it means that you are enjoying the, the new way that I'm publishing these longer format videos. I think they don't really make sense in a uh, regular YouTube because nobody has that kind of patience. Like the, the amount of views on long form stuff is, is always gonna be lower. I don't think podcasts make sense as videos, but I do want to try to more often be putting out video versions of the podcast because I've known it's the right thing to do for a long time now. And we have time on our hands. So I'm going to be putting a little more effort into trying to get as many guests as possible to also create video versions. So there will be more of that to come. Subscribe and you'll see them. I have a guest on this week that I'm very excited to talk to. It's Alex Lindsay, who I've been listening to Alex for a very long time. He's been a resource both for me and many other Mac and technology fans out there. Hey, Alex, thanks for coming on. Hey, thank you. Thanks th thanks for having me. And I, I just want to give you a big nod for, uh, you know, inspiring the way that I talk about things because when I'd hear you get into production information on Mac Break Weekly, I'd often feel like, why aren't there more people that are doing this deep dive into the, the hard stuff? And I realize it's because there's a relatively, there's a smaller audience. There's less people out there that are buying the fancy gear that you're using and uh, doing this high-end professional work. But that's what's really interesting to me. I always want to aspire well, towards it. So, and I think a lot of people hold it as, and and I have in the past uh, hold it as, that's your secret sauce. Like knowing how to do this is, you know, a lot of us that do live events, knowing how to do it for the last ten years was something that wasn't was a rare skill set, and uh, and so if you had it, people would just call you and you could kind of just make up a number of how much it would cost, and then they would do it. And so it was you know, because it was just that there were there weren't a lot of other choices. And so um, and I think that for me, I was very careful. I, I I would definitely talk about things, but I wouldn't really dig into how I did it. 
And now in the current situation that we're in, the reason I'm un- doing more of this is because I need people to be successful. You know, so I lo- I'm looking at my entire industry. If my entire industry isn't succeeding, if people are failing at their at their online events, if they're failing at what they're doing, then people aren't going to move forward. And we have an opportunity right now to move live events from you know kind of the somewhere in the back to the primary stage for most companies and organizations and governments and people and everything else. This, in my opinion, should be front front and center. That's a great place to start, though. Is- could you tell us a little bit more about what exactly it is that you do other than just be a co-host on a, one of my favorite podcasts? <laughs> yeah, so I I got into it by accident. I, I don't I can't say that I had a plan. I uh, I was I, I finished working at Industrial Light Magic and Lucasfilm in the late '90s. Uh, I was working on Episode One, and I felt like I was part of what was called the Rebel Mac Unit. And the Rebel Mac Unit was a was a small division inside of Industrial Light and Magic that was finding cheaper, faster ways to uh, produce uh, content. My office mate was Sue Mashwitz from Red Giant. Uh, there were you know a bunch of guys that that uh, yeah. There's a bunch of um, uh, other great people who have started all kinds of effects firms that came out of that. But what I came out with was that hey, anybody could do this, and I don't want to try to compete them with them all. I I want to teach them how to do it. And I want people to be able to communicate what they want to communicate, whether that's with graphics or video to the rest of the world, and how do I empower them to do that? So I left, I left the company and started doing, you know, training and started building a community. And at first it was a, a little community in, 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 in my office and down where the, the ballpark is now in San Francisco. And five people would come in every Monday and I'd go, so we're going to take over the world. Do you want to play? And they'd be like, yeah. You know, and so so then we and the, and that number kept on getting bigger until we had like 200 people every Monday showing up in in downtown San Francisco, and I was like, I got to start charging you guys for this because I don't even know how we're going to pay for the uh, you know for the office. And so then they started paying for it, and then we had a little bit, of, and we got bigger, and we had we were training people, and then we put it online, and 2,000 people signed up from 40 countries. And so then we're trying to teach classes to for, these people all over the world, and and keep them busy and keep them excited and and engage with them. And that led to kind of understanding how to build what I would call centerless events, which is really what I specialize in. So I do online events and I do a lot of live streaming. But what I really specialize in is is some people will call them virtual events, but I would call them centerless events, which means there is no center. There is there are producers that are somewhere in the world, there are talent that's somewhere in the world, the viewers are somewhere in the world, but there is no master control in one place, typically. I mean, there might be a master control that's, that's managing some of the signals, but all of this stuff is spread out all over the world. And so, and there's just not many people that know how to do that. So we were kind of building that up. Google was launching Hangouts and having trouble with supporting VIPs. Uh, that was primarily what they were worried about. Anybody could do it, but if you've got a big actor or a head of state how do you make sure that it works? And so Google brought us into, and we didn't fail at the first one, which evidently was a high bar for some other production companies. And um, and so Google was like, well, they seem to know what they're doing and just crushed us. And so there were like three or four years where we don't, I, don't, I barely remember what I, uh, where I was in the, in the world, you know, doing these events. And we really, you know, the first couple hundred were rough. And then we <laughs> slowly started building a pattern of yeah. how to do it. So by the time we got to, you know, eight or 900 events, we really started building a, a, a pretty good workflow on how to build these centerless events, how to build up the comms, how to do the audio, how to do the video, how to work with all the participants, all the hosts, how to you know get well, that all working. And so, and when you say building, become, you're also physically there assembling gear as well. You're not just consulting from a distance or setting up software. Like this is actually putting physical stuff together. So it depends on the it depends on the project. So. A lot of our work was definitely putting hardware on the ground. And so um, a lot of our clients wanted something that was a little bit more than a webcam. And uh, and so we would build up um, a lot of hardware and, you know, at given locations. And most of our work was on, on site. So we, we did a lot of that. And then, but a lot, but what was the growing from a, not so much from a revenue perspective, but from a uh, number of events perspective, what really grew was building a master control where we ran the event. So if you can think about a Zoom event, or a hangout where you have a director who is really cutting the show from their from their office, but you know they're interacting. It's not just letting Zoom do what it's going to do, or le- letting the hangout just kind of free roam. It's really making decisions, um, but it's also having an open slide with a countdown clock and being able to do playback and being able to close it and being able to build an actual event. Uh, and and those are the things that we slowly figured out how to do. And we got to a point where we were doing for 
a period of time before Google kind of moved away from Hangouts on Air, we were doing three to five a week, you know, for years. Mm -hmm. So it was it was a it was a a busy time for us, um, and uh, it was a it was a good a good moment as far as learning how to do this. And every project is different, had different issues. So we for the high profile events, we definitely sent people to the location. Uh, for the lower, uh, you know, smaller events or ones with less budget, we would send kits. And then for some, we would just call them and do the best we could to prep them for the show. So it just depended on, on what the budget was, what the time frame was. Those are the things that, that really made a difference for us. If we were doing something with, let's say, we did a couple events with Obama. With Obama, we put people at every location. You know, <laughs> we want to make right. sure that that they look good, sound good, and we would we would build up in the White House to to make sure that he looks great and and sounds great, and and so, um, but with you know some of the other you know other folks that we worked with, we definitely you know just had someone that we brought in over over Hangouts and 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 then brought everybody else in over Hangouts, um, and now and now Zoom at this point, and we're building some other tools that will leverage other other technologies. Well, there's not a lot of people that are more qualified to talk about streaming at this point, and. I don't know about you, but when I look around in the last week or two, as everybody has started to stay home, I've never seen so many people streaming. Um, a lot of them in very basic ways, like the amount of Instagram lives that I see getting turned on and Facebook lives and everybody just has this need because we are, you know, talking to a lot less people per day to have this immediate back and forth interaction. Um, and so, so I, I mean, I think you would have some useful information not for anybody, like what are some, right. for example, what are the strengths and weaknesses of live? Like, when does it make sense if somebody wants to right. connect with an audience? Why should they turn on a live camera, a live microphone versus pre-editing, pre-creating it and, and releasing it later? Oftentimes, what, what, when clients ask, ask me that, there's basically three uh, reasons to go live, in my opinion. You have uh, sports because it's, you know, we want to know who right. won. We have breaking news, but only breaking news, not news in general. And then finally, uh, interaction. You know, so if we're going to interact with the online audience, now most of us are not really worried about sports or or breaking news, but what we really want to focus on is interaction. If we're not interacting with the audience, if we're not letting them vote or interact with the with the um, process or ask questions, then it, in, in my opinion, you probably can do a VOD. Now you may decide you're going to do. A, a live playback and then you're interacting in the comment engine that's another way to, to make, kind of make that work mm -hmm. but the most powerful way to do this is to interact with your audience and you need very little technology if you're doing that and if you look at the success of people who are streaming whether it's TikTok or Instagram or Facebook live what they're doing or YouTube live what they're doing is they're answering questions and what we see when they're interacting and they're calling people out, we're seeing a higher level of engagement. We're seeing a longer average view time. And average view time as a live producer is all I care about. The marketing team's job is to get people to into the room. My job is to keep them in the room. And so what I'm looking at is how do I hold on to them you know, throughout the event? And then somebody else's job sometimes is to figure out what to show them after they left the room. And so right. VOD becomes another thing. And, and these are all, these all have their own tensions because for instance, a great live event is usually not a great VOD event. You have to really cut it down because mm -hmm. uh, because what we're going to do is we're going to it's going to be wide open and we're going to be interacting with people and and the and the schedule is not going to be there and we're going to move around and be fluid because that's what we're going to have this conversation with the online audience. That's not as great if you're not part of that conversation when it happened. And so so that you know the you have to rethink how you do a lot of these things. And that is hard for people to get around because they're thinking about, well, then we're going to package it up and put it out as a podcast. And that is harder, harder to do when you want to do a great live show when you're answering everybody's questions. If you look at like the virtual, the Final Cut virtual user group that we did, that was really us just experimenting with that, that format. Even if you look at a lot of professional podcasters that do this every week, they're used to talking into a microphone for hours at a time. Then they go on tour for their live show. There will be this really different energy to the listeners at home that is hard for them to reconcile sometimes, like realizing that gap between getting the feedback from a, a live room and that it's not necessarily c connecting to the, the VOD people later. Right, and, and I think that the other thing is is that uh, we're still in this kind of, we feel like we have to have people in the room. You know, the, the, mm. when, you, when you add people to, the, to a live event in the room, you are automatically demoting everybody online. So that is, you just have to know that you're doing it. 
And the ones that are going to be the next generation of event people are not going to do that. They are going to do it without anybody. They're going to look straight into it. And a lot of it has to do with things like eye contact. So I've been really studying this a lot because we've been trying to figure out why some people do this really well. And even now, like when you and I are talking and we're looking at our screen and so we're looking slightly <laughs> under, but, yeah. if I, but, but right now, if I look up and I look at my camera, now I'm looking mm -hmm. straight at you. And we use a lot of teleprompters to, to kind of force that. So yeah. one of the things that, that is important in that eye contact process is there's something about really feeling like you're talking to someone. And the interesting thing is when we started radio, when I started doing radio, I, uh, what we were what I was coached on to figure out because I didn't get to go to college radio I went straight into commercial radio I was sweeping the floors and they just liked my voice and so then I was doing ads and then I was doing Saturday morning and then I was doing weekday weekday drive and somewhere in the middle of that a DJ said don't think about because I was kind of like hey how's it going we're having a great time blah, 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 blah. you know like you know it's it's 37 degrees outside you know like that whole Standard like radio announcer fair. type radio fair and he said don't think about uh, you're ta that you're talking to 100,000 people or 50,000 people. Just talk to one. Mm, Just talk yeah. to one person on the other side of that camera. And I was watching the, uh, the, the thing about Mr. Rogers, the documentary about Mr. Rogers. My daughter really wanted to watch it, and so we, we were watching it over the weekend. And he was talking about that. And I think that when you look at, and then you look at Errol Morris's uh, Interatron system that basically forces the person to look straight through the teleprompter, which we modeled around doing interviews for Salesforce for hundreds of interviews. And then we just took straight into doing our events where we gave teleprompters. We, the largest teleprompter I think we made was like a 60 inch teleprompter, which by the way is really dangerous because if the glass <laughs> breaks, in case you're wondering, you will die. You know, like oh, it'll cut your hand imagine, and you're yeah. like, you know, like, it's like a so store we were, window. It was, we, there was a big discussion about that. And so anyway, <laughs> so, uh, cause it's like big plate glass. It doesn't have, it's not safe. You know, like we, yeah. we, we were carrying it into, into a, a high profile location thinking this is the dumbest thing I've ever done. So, but the, anyway, the, um, uh, getting that, that interaction, that eye contact and that straight, you know, talking to someone is so important. And, and I think that when we, and, and like, if you look at, uh, um, uh, DeMello, I can't, Car uh, Charlie DeMello, Carla Mello, this is horrible because I watch TikTok and I can't remember the, she's the most popular <laughs> I don't watch it enough, so, uh, you, I'll, I'll so defer to you. I, think, I believe it's Charlie DeMello. You, when you don't say it, when you see someone's name, you don't think about the yeah, of DeMello, I think. You don't, you don't think about There's how to pronounce words it, I can't you know, pronounce. so. So anyway, she's got 35 million followers and she's, you know, and she's, she's, all she does is little dances, but what she's really good at is looking straight into the camera, mm -hmm. you know, and, a, and the way she looks into the camera is, is very powerful. And I think that that's not, maybe not the whole thing. She was there early. She's been doing, she's very regular. She does a lot of all the right things for TikTok. But the point is, is that she's making this eye contact. And I think a lot of people on TikTok are doing that. And, and that's part of what makes it engaging. And in the same way, the... We're not seeing that in most broadcasts because we're not used to it. We're, we're used to events where someone's in the room or we're used to um, – and, and what's interesting is is the things like Hangouts. That's what we noticed. Hangouts often felt much more intimate than a round table with everybody in the room. There's, I, I realized there were many round tables that I saw that I would rather watch over Hangouts or Zoom than I would watching them in a round table because they're looking at me the right. whole time. Yeah. Like there's no side shots. There's no whatever. There's a straight-on shot – looking straight into my eyes all the time. And so that is a really powerful format. But when we start adding audience, we take that away. And now you're just in the back of the audience and you're not you're, you're kind of an invisible fly on the wall to the to the event. And that's a huge difference. And I think that we, we have to rethink that as when we're doing these live events. And people are going to be like, well, I don't feel the energy. Well, you, you know, you have to learn how to do that. And, yeah. and the energy you're now going to feel is is the energy that are coming that's coming in from those comments and from people you might bring in to the event and there's all kinds of things i you know i we we were doing this patreon event last week and and uh, jack conti who's the who is the uh, ceo or founder of of uh, patreon yeah. and great speaker just lots the of energy. greatest guy well he's just the greatest guy you know they, yeah. you have a it's a it's a two billion dollar company run by a rock star i mean <laughs> yeah, like yeah, how yeah, often totally. do you get that you know and, and yeah. it's just an amazing guy and and so he has so much energy and so much authenticity. He is the prototypical person that should be doing live every week because yes. you just feel like you're part of his family. And then he is so good at looking at his comments and just getting them all riled up and, and getting inspired by them and talking to them and, and everything else. And he's using these cr cr crude tools and being great.
I think that's the biggest issue. And I see normal people, which that, that's what I'm seeing a lot of right now. It's just everybody, you know, we are all just jumping on live because we just want to have that immediate contact, right. but struggling with that balance of the, the relationships of the viewers and the people commenting and your performance and not realizing that there even is a balance to be struck. Um, the default can just be, well, people are here, so they're just going to watch me do whatever I'm doing, but they don't realize that, you know, three or four seconds of complete silence while you read comments can really kill the energy pretty quickly if you don't know how to keep it moving forward. And so we had to build a bunch of tools. So we have a bunch of backend tools that basically tie into uh, Facebook and, uh, let's see, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. We're, we just added Twitch. We're adding, I think we're working on Zoom right now. They basically rip all those comments out and allow us to process them, do a little, uh, little AI to get rid of the junk and then hand them off to humans to kind of process them to get them, you know, get them through. And, and those are the things that are that process is super powerful because it allows you it allows the host to stay focused and it allows us to hand all that content to them uh, relatively easily. And, and, and you're right, that's really hard to do. And especially if you have a popular live stream. So if you've got a low frequency live, live stream, which is mm -hmm. less than 50 comments a, a minute, it's not that hard. You know, a comment every second or so is easy for you to, to manage. When you get over, over 200 comments a minute, it becomes very difficult right. to pay attention. And, and we've had ones, the, I think the highest we've had for an event, that I, I don't think I can name because it didn't, uh, is about 140,000 in, inter, interactions a minute. And, um, yeah. And, yeah. That, and, and, I, I and that's manage that. unusable. <laughs> that's unusable. Yeah. Like, so if you don't have a system to, to manage that, it becomes, um, you know, and so that, these are all the challenges that are, that are now hitting us now that we're moving to live. But as you get started, you don't have to worry about that. You'll be in a low frequency event for a while. Well, and I'd even say people that are in those low frequency events, like the, the, you know, moms and dads at home, just trying to connect with their, their neighbors, it can, the most valuable thing, it, if you are starting to lose track can even just be having someone else watching like another human that is filtering out questions for you. Like uh, that, that's what I've done once or twice is just somebody's keeping an eye on it and maybe they're texting the best questions to you. And there's a bit of a delay, but having, if you can't filter it mentally yourself, having somebody else just take that mental load off can be a huge asset. And we've definitely done that. We've, we've done a couple of different ways of doing that. Uh, we, uh, Google Docs turns out to be really useful for this or any kind of shared doc. You just have a, a, a doc open that people are just uh, adding to. And, and what's nice is they'll add notes, they'll add other things. And one of the things that's important is, is if you're the person putting that into Google Docs is to delete stuff that has already been covered. Because what you don't want is the host to look up and try to figure out what's next. Mm. You know, so usually what we do is we, we get people to make the text really big and figure out what they can see and keep it to like three or four lines and just delete right. the th delete anything else. And that helps the host stay focused uh, and, and allows them to kind of move through that process. The other thing that we do is that we literally read them. So one of the things that we did... Oh, probably 12 years ago. So this is like really way back. We used to do this thing with the pixel core where what we would do is I was on the, on the, it was, I think it might've might been a public, I think it was just our members, but I had, um, I was walking around with a live view. So Doug Dalton is a friend of mine and, and we were walking around. Uh, he, he had a camera and a live view and I'm walking around NAB with him, just walking from booth to booth and asking people questions. The online audience is, is typing in questions that they see while they're doing it. And then uh, Carolyn Stamping, who's a, um, who's a, who was working with me at the time, she's reading them into my ear. So I go, okay, we heard that, you know, she'd say, this is <laughs> right. the, because I didn't have any, at the time we didn't have it. This was before iPads. We didn't have a tablet. I didn't have any way to, to share it. You know, so she's just reading me the questions, you know, live on, you know, uh, on air. And so that is another way to, you know, kind of, you just got to figure it out. But that was super popular, you know, like, like people right. loved, you know, having that of being pulled in and being part of that process. But again, I think that we're going to, I don't know if physical events will ever be the same after this. You know, I think that we're going to see, you, you know, this is, we were going this direction, but we're simply accelerating oh, yeah. the process. And, and I think that as we build these tools and, and the reason that I'm out there now suddenly trying to teach everybody to do it is I have to admit, I'm, I'm trying to push the physical events to the side. You know, I think that we need to move forward as a human race, you know, away from, 
you know, having everybody fly to a location and figure really out how to do this. I'm not saying that we can't interact with each other or we should interact with each other. I think that that's an important thing, but I think we shouldn't have to. I think that we should, you know, I think that we need to build the tools that allow us all to be part of this larger conversation. Well, I'm sure we've both been through the experience of being, being at NAB versus looking at it online and how much, or with any event, how much more you can absorb just by (laughs) <laughs> having somebody pre-filter it with some kind of digital uh, right. medium, you know, ha- being able to sift through it at your own time. Of course, there 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 is a loss, like there's trade-offs, but um, I th- it will be really interesting to see what happens with both WWDC and NAB and everything I was excited right. to be at. Um, they're going to be the um, the way that they're covered will level up a lot. I am sure whatever Maybe. they do. They're going to try anyway. They're going to try. I mean, I think that that's the hard part for event companies and, and corporations that are doing this is that they have to they have to get out of their own comfort zone. They have to move past, you know, what I call event skeuomorphism. Mm. So event skeuomorphism is I want to try to reproduce. We keep on having people tell me. Put on VR glasses and walk through the conference hall. Yeah, so. they, they want to they want to reproduce the physical, yeah. the, the magical physical. You know, it's the same thing with like 24P. I hope, I, I hope I don't insult anybody here. But 24P is, you know, a bunch of cheapskates in the 20s said, how low can we go before people will notice and then they pick 24p and this has become a magical thing and, and i'm just kind of like you know it's just a frame rate that a bunch of guys were using to try to save money you know and, and so in the same way the and i'm not you know i'm fine i do 24p too i mean i'm, I'm just <laughs> saying that it's a funny thing sure yeah that that we that we do and so same reason we use a floppy disks as a save icon you get stuck in a in a concept yeah you get stuck in this old old concept and in events we keep on you know they want to have i want to have a keynote and then i want it to everyone understands i have a keynote and then I have four session rooms that are going at the same time. Now, the reason we do that is because we had to spend a lot of money to get everybody there and not everybody's interested in the same thing. But, you know, we don't have to do it all in three days anymore because people aren't paying for hotel rooms. So why don't we just take this thing and stretch it out to be four times longer and let people, you know, come in in the evenings and, and be part of it where they, you know, they don't, we don't have to do this anymore. And so, so the thing is, is that now everybody can get all the, and if they don't want to watch that night, don't watch or watch the video later. But the point is, is that we don't have to run every everything in parallel because not every there's a bunch of things that we're requiring that out of physical events that no longer are there so we're we're constraining ourselves to an old constraint and in a uh, one of my favorite terms for this is we're putting new wine into old wine skins you know, you know we are we are basically you know that that doesn't work because the wine expands you know and so so the thing is is that it's important that we think about there are new restrictions we, we, we can't shake hands we can't net, network in the same way we did before but It doesn't mean that we can't, like, for instance, what we need to be thinking about is how do we have an ongoing relationship? We're not going to have this once a year where we all get together in the, you know, again, in in the stuff that I've been doing previously with, uh, you know, a paid social network, which is essentially what what my uh, what the Pixel Core was, you know, a decade ago is. You know, we, we were working on projects together. We were learning together. We were doing all those things together. And 10 years after we stopped doing it, people still feel like they're family. You know, like, you know, there are, you know, they, they still use their old profile pictures. They still feel there's, a, there's this mm-hmm. affinity towards that. That was an incredibly deep connection that we created. We had people building companies that had never met each other in person, you know, and so, and they, I mean, that, that exists today. And so the, the thing is, is that it is, it, it, it isn't about being in physical, I mean, I'm not, again, not saying that we shouldn't be phys- in physical contact with each other, just saying it's not required. Right. Like it, it is something that we enjoy. I think that we can definitely do many of the things, but we have to unthink, unlearn a lot of the things that we have about events. Now, the problem is, is that all these event companies, they know how to do what they know how to do. And so that they are taking the thing that, and, and this is the way film started. We were shooting film of stage, stage plays, right? Because we know we are now going to film that. Pretty soon we realized, you know, we don't have to be constrained to a stage. We can shoot anywhere we want. Then we figured out how to, and by, by the matrix, we were not even using the camera anymore. You know, so, so, the, so we, we keep on evolving that, that idea, but we just need to move out of that thought process. Again, event skeuomorphism of trying to make it look like the event. That doesn't matter. What you're, you have to back up, and I just wrote this article on virtual events, and, but you need to back up and what's important. I want to connect with people. I want to teach them something about my product or about an idea. I want them to l- allow them to connect to each other. You know, those are the things that are important. So figure out how to do what the goal is, not how to reproduce what you were doing, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, it absolutely does. And if we scale the conversation back a little bit from the you know the blockbuster live events like conferences and to everybody's new reality of working from home and maybe just streaming in terms of just dealing with coworkers, just having you know right. small groups of conversations. Everybody suddenly jumped on Zoom. What can people learn about that? I mean, I spent I spent quite a while actually. Uh, when I was working at uh, Stocksy, and actually, yeah, I come from iStock in the old days, and my friend Kelly Thompson oh, said nice. to say hi. Yeah, um, and we I, I used to do that a lot. Like I'd, tr- I'd work on the road, so I'd spend a lot of time in Zoom, and a lot of our communications right. were through Slack and even AIM before that. But many people, this is not something that they are used to, and having to connect on a regular basis through their computer is very strange, and uh, they're just getting used to it. What are some things that, that that everybody could use right away as tips? I mean, even even one thing actually, if you could tell me why is it Zoom that everybody has jumped on right now? What about it is attracting the whole world at this moment? Well, I think that the Zoom is the easiest one to jump on. I think that that's the issue. Their free their free services has you know Google had a kind of a free service. I don't know if Hangouts now. I think Meet is part of your Google Suite or. I'm not sure if there's a I don't Google. know where it is either. That's actually, we were using Google before we went to Zoom uh, back at Stocks. Right. Now, Zoom has, from a corporate perspective, Zoom has a ton more tools. So Google Meet is super low, uh, low touch, right? There's almost no tools. It used to be. We kept on adding tools. In fact, there was an API to Hangouts on Air that we used that uh, we built, re- almost rebuilt the Hangout in, internally where we could do some really cool editing uh, with, with, with uh, Hangout where we were mixing how the hangout used average volume and and then how we wanted to control it so it was a mixture of a person and the computer at the same time editing and it created a much better event and so there was all these great tools that that we had access to and then google took them all out and put them made meat Mm -hmm. um i think that they really really missed the boat (laughs) if anyone from google's now now they're now somebody's picking themselves wow did you miss this one so um and, and but it was so great what they had, what they were building was so amazing that, that it was, it was just frustrating for us to, that, that, that it got lost. But the Skype, I think the, the hard part with Skype is that, is that to be honest with you, it's the login process. Like I forget my right. login, like Microsoft started forcing us to change our login all the time. Then I forgot. I had one that I used for 10 years, which I, I know you're not supposed to do, but it's just Skype. Like, I don't yeah. care. Like I'm not doing chats on it. I just want to connect. And so it was easy for me to connect. And then Microsoft started making me change my password. Now I forget it all the time. And it, you know, because, because the app is hard, you know, I have to remember to paste it into LastPass or paste it out of LastPass. There's no automatic way for me to log in. I mean, I know that sounds like a simple thing, but it's those little pain oh, points sure. when the water is going really fast, when there's one little thing in the or little rock, every, all the water goes around it. And so, so what's happened is Zoom is really easy. You can link, you can jump in from a corporate perspective. There's a ton of control. The webinar, the webinar system lets you build it. So a lot of people are using it. The meets are easy to, easy to use. They're relatively good as a consumer product got a lot of problems it doesn't have very good audio the video is just okay um it's a, i think that the interface the interface isn't built for an event the interface is built for you to have a, a conference call mm-hmm. you know and, and that's what it's really good at uh, it's not good at the next generation of i want to build something that is um you know one of these bigger events and i'm not saying when i say bigger event i'm not trying to replace dreamforce uh you know or you know but wwdc or smaller even hundreds of people you're better off doing it online because if you think about it oh i'm going to do it in a place now you're forcing everybody to do to fly in to get hotels to do all those things how can you have that interaction as a business where you're not being constrained by your geographic location because that's what we're doing every time we do these live events we're constraining our impact to a geographic location. We're doing, you know, some of these companies, you know, Fortune 10 company will typically do between five and 10,000 events, I'm sorry, five and 15,000 events a year. Like we just had to remember that they're doing a lot of these events and you know what they're doing? They're doing 60 of the same event around the world. That Mm -hmm. is cray cray, cray cray, that they would be doing that. You know, like, (laughs) you know, they should be doing resources. When you could do six, yeah. You know, like, you know, in different time zones, you know, you, you, you know, you do it two times in different time zones with thousands of people in it. And but the key is the tools that allow you to do that effectively aren't there yet. And so that's one of the things that that we're busily working on is getting those getting those tools up to ground. Up well, to speed. So when people, again, like still at a smaller scale are considering where they want to stream, whatever it is, they're, you know, maybe they're a fitness instructor uh, trying to reach out to everybody that's staying at home or they're an artist trying to share their painting or maybe doing tutorials like I do, 
what are some different considerations we can take into account when we choose which platform to use? So for example, uh, the two places I would stream are Instagram and YouTube. I have a much bigger audience on YouTube, but I actually end up streaming way more often on Instagram because it's infinitely easier, much, much, much easier. And um, I also, it also feels lower stakes, whereas I feel like on YouTube, I need to, um, I need, it needs to be better, basically. Um, those are things I think about, but. I think that Instagram, from my perspective, is a great place to start. It's easy, but it'll never scale. So right. you'll never be able to do anything better. So, you know, so that when you're building into the Instagram thing, you know, there's no, there's some hacks to get into the back end of Instagram, you know, to stream to it in a proper way. But overall, it's a phone and you're never, and there's no option to go bigger than the phone, which is a nice constraint. I, I'm, I'm sure that they've made that decision. They want to keep everybody on the same playing field, but they're keeping everybody on a really boring playing field. Right. And so, and so the, you know, it, it's fine and it gives people that freedom and no one feels like they have to work too hard and that's a good place to start. But if you're successful at it, you are going to want to grow. So the problem that Instagram has created is they have a situation where as soon as someone's good at it, they're going to leave the platform. That's crazy. You know, like it's just, it's just the it's the craziest. Yeah, right. The bigger they get, the more likely they are to leave. I was successful, so now I'm going to go to YouTube. Or I'm going to go to Facebook. Or I'm going to go to whatever. And so, so the you know the way we look at it, it really depends on your the, the nature of your following. So you know, Facebook is really good if you have a large following already and you can advertise into that um, market. the The problem is there's not a lot of earned views on Facebook right now. If you're if you're streaming out a profile, there can be, but out of a, if you're streaming from a page, you, you really have to pay for most of your views. Right. Um, but if you have a large following on that page, you're able to, um, you're able to activate that with a relatively low cost ad budget because you have people there that you can, that are already pre-qualified. So, so those are, you know, you're, you're well, going to do some earn, some spend to, to pull that which in. Which platforms could you simultaneously stream to? All, with, well, with the right tools, all of them. Other I mean, you than know, we, Instagram. Right, we're other cut than out of Instagram, Instagram and TikTok. Instagram yeah. and TikTok are are, are mobile only, right. um, and and it's why everything looks b bad, in my opinion. You know, like <laughs> yeah. like you know, like on, on on those two things. And so, like TikTok is really bad, um, which is funny because that's one of the number one places that the creators make money, right? And so, but that's all they can do, and they, and I think they want to keep them all all there for now. And there's ways to hack it, um, you know, to uh, you know, in that process. But the you know the one that is the so the two big ones if you're corporate streaming and you want a um, a white label experience the most easy way the easiest way to do that is that you hire um you know you, you get a live stream you know live stream that's part of vimeo uh live stream account that's probably the easiest one after that you start talking to people like me where we you know at 090 media we have you know akamai account <laughs> so right. so we can get you know give you a You're player that yeah. is infinitely scalable and 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 you don't have to pay the upfront to Akamai and you know all those other things that are there so so there's there's a couple different ways to manage that but you're just but you are when you're not using one of the public CDNs like a YouTube or a Facebook you're paying per bit right so if you're really successful it can be a really big bill so you have to kind of think about that process whereas if you're streaming to something like you know Facebook or um, or YouTube, it doesn't matter how big the event gets, it's going to be free for you, you know? And so, um, you, you give up some of the stuff that you have lead generation, you know, other things like that. And so, so those are some of the things for you to, you know, you have to kind of consider in that process. Now, if you're also the other one to look at is if you're doing company wide things, one of the things to look at is that, you know, zoom is really good for small meetings where you can have it, but if you're going to scale up Facebook workplace is a pretty amazing, you know, internal streaming system. They have, at the pro level, they have, you know, you can stream to everybody at a enterprise level, you can use uh, peer to peer, which will take reduce the impact on the uh, on large headquarters, you can't have everybody streaming at one time at a large headquarter without shutting it down, shutting the whole building yeah. down. So you need to have a peer to peer system and, and that's built in. And so, so there's a bunch of ways that that can be, um, you know, that can be handled uh, your view time, again, which is important to us, tends to be higher on YouTube than on Facebook. And that's our theory behind that is that Facebook, because it has a, because you have a feed, you have people that are more likely to leave. Your finger's ready to scroll. Yeah, you're like, okay, I'm, I'm bored. I'm going to move on. And the same thing with TikTok. Yeah. Like TikTok, it's funny. You're like, I remember watching short videos on YouTube. On TikTok, like if someone gets to like 18 seconds, 20 seconds, and they're not amazingly interesting, yeah. we're like, okay, we're done. My kids and I watch TikTok on a on our TV in the living room. And so so we'll sit there and go, oh, no, we're done. You know, and, and we move on. And so 
uh, YouTube, you're making more of a commitment. So you're getting there, you're, you're on a page, there's less distraction, and you, you, we, we tend to see higher, higher view times. Is there a reason for people to look at Switch or Mixer if they are not gaming? Or is that uh, kind of the only universe that should bother spending the time over there? You know, the, you know, Mixer is really still more of a game platform. I think that uh, Twitch is definitely uh, expanding. So, and caffeine.tv is also one that is really working on low latency and, 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 and expanding, but they're still Twitch and caffeine, I think are still really, uh, game leaning, uh, you know, gamer leaning, uh, but they are both trying to expand and they both are expanding and they, what they have, you know, what Twitch really has is great audience interaction tools. That's why, I mean, we see astronomical average view times on Twitch mm-hmm. and, and it's because people are, it's not just because they're watching games, it's because they're interacting with each other and their right. tools to do that are better than everybody else's. And so, and, and but I think caffeine is other, the other one that's working on it. Is that like the, the chat room is having fun on the side as well or yeah. that the uh, like chat rooms having fun on, them? they're having fun on the side, they're interacting with, and, and most of the Twitch celebrities are really good at interacting with their audience, mm-hmm. you know? And so they're, you know, they're, they're really, cause that's how they're making money, you know? And so the, the model is much different. And, and I think that everyone is trying to kind of play catch up with that, but I don't think anybody has gotten that. And I think that they got to that organically. I don't think they made a plan for that. I think that they just found it themselves happened. there right. with the right tools. And so, and it's a, it's those are the, but I think that the interaction is the uh, interaction is the thing, right? That's the thing that is, makes it work. It's the engine that, that really makes these events um, take off. And I think most of the platforms are not very good at it. And, and even Twitch, I would say that uh, Twitch is very rudimentary. It's just better than the other ones. It's like at, it's at two and everybody else is at one out of 10. <laughs> that's not that's not that great. But I think we're suddenly going to move forward pretty quickly in uh, all yeah, of this. There's going to be a lot of money. Few months. There's a lot of money that's dump, is going to dump into this right now. Absolutely. And a lot of people are going to get some, some uh, resources to uh, evolve. Yeah, and if people at home are looking to upgrade their resources and be able to stream better, um, you know, personally, my recommendation from what I see people doing is a good place to start is to think a lot more about your audio. I think that's right now yep. very underrated. A lot of people will just, you know, put a camera across the room with no consideration of <laughs> how the audio is even getting in there. You if you're not a full reverb of the space, the main thing is if you're really if if you are uh, talking, yeah. Uh, and not showing anything. The only thing that matters is your audio. <laughs> yeah, so much more you know, like 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 if, if people video, because what's going to happen is is that you're going to walk their phone away. Down. Yeah. yeah, but you're gonna you're gonna well they're gonna put their phone down or they're gonna yeah they're gonna put their phone down they're gonna put it on uh, whatever they they want to listen to it. There's no reason for them to monotask you mm-hmm. if you are if you're just talking. If you this conversation that you and I are having, most people will probably listen to it. They're not going to you know necessarily of course you know, yeah. I, you know they're gonna they're, they're gonna walk away very, and listen. And so it'd be weird to stare right. at this the whole time. That's like a 1950s uh, way of right 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 <laughs> exactly. So so the. What you want to think about is if you're showing things, you, you, then you need a good camera. But if people are just, if it's a bunch of talking heads and they're all talking to each other, you got to make the audio great. That means get heads, get a headphones, you know, so that you're not using, you don't want to rely on the echo cancellation within Skype or Zoom because that's actually removing audio out of your feed. It has to remove it because otherwise it would echo back. So you're, you're basically slicing and dicing your audio very quickly if you don't have a headphone in. So number one is get that headphone in to, um, you know, to, to give it, make it work less. Number two is get a great mic. And there are lots, there are good USB mics. I think it's the, I think I, I posted a couple of those on Twitter, but it's well, the uh, Audio Technica, the Yeti, the blue, yeah. uh, the blue, the Yeti, the um, the Shure MV51. I think it's an MV51. It looks like a little 50s mic. Those are all great USB mics to get started. I'm go to, I use a USB interface and a, and an audio mic. So like you and I are both using PR40s. These are mm-hmm. high PR PR40s. Then I use a Mix Pre 3 to uh oh, as a usb interface yeah. yeah yeah and so and that's going to give you the highest quality that you can get online you know to to make that work the the, the, the heil and the and the mix pre are, are pretty much the best uh solution for that then when i'm doing training the problem is the heil has such off axis good off axis rejection it's great because I've got some fans over here and I've got other things. My kids are in the other room <laughs> right. and you can't hear them because but it's, it's rejecting all of that. <laughs> but if I turn my head, so like if I'm training or I'm trying to show you something, the Heil is not a great solution because of that off axis rejection. So then I use a, I personally use a DPA 4066, which is not the cheapest way to go, but there's lots of headset mics that you can find in the, it's going to be a couple hundred dollar range. The 
DPA is in the higher hundreds of dollar range. And so, but it's, um, and I, I've been researching, try, a lot of us are talking about like, what is the best headset mic? And we, I'm told that it's the crown. I guess it's, um, the, uh, crown makes one and i was like crown the guys that make the amps and yes they make evidently they make this 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 large oh, yeah. aperture uh uh you know condenser or whatever that, that is supposed to be really good so i'm i'm now looking at getting one to see how if it sounds that much better than my dpa the nice thing about the dpa is you can barely see it so well, it's a it's a nice one for video also for so many people uh it can even go a step back of they may not be upgrading to a mic but you just need to get whatever mic you have a lot closer so we've been doing a, a a new little series uh, that my wife's been posting um, where we're doing interviews kind of like this, but all of the people on the other side have no equipment, right? So we're all set up here. Right. We've got great audio on our end, but we want them to sound as good as possible. It's a lot of challenges in that. What we've come to is the solution right now is first of all, they're wearing headphones and hopefully there's a better mic or a closer mic to their mouth in those headphones. Right. And then as a backup, we're having them put their cell phone on the computer where you know we're having the Skype call, the cell phone is recording a selfie pointing right at them, and hopefully they're right. sitting close enough to that iPhone or Samsung mic that it's pretty decent microphone might well, give us also, the best possible audio. If they have a front shirt, shirt pocket, we've also had them throw it upside oh, yeah, down in one. their shirt pocket, and it gets them within eight inches. and And the phones rock when you get that close. They're 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 uh, a lot of engineers make that work pretty well. I don't know how they sound so good. Sometimes I'm shocked at at what is coming out of a cell phone if it's in the right place. Mad. It's it's <laughs> incredible, mad. like mad. Well, yeah. I look at. I can't believe the the what makes what amazes me is that I have a HomePod in the corner of my kitchen. And it's playing something at its maximum volume, and I call out to it to stop, and it stops. Right. And I, yeah. I'm like, I don't, I have no idea how that so works. Weird. I mean, they wrote a white paper, so I have a kind of an idea how it works. Yeah. But I'm still amazed that it even that, that that even happens. And so the other thing that little tricks that we do also when we're dealing with folks that are going to just be best effort, that's what we call them as best effort, which right. means I can't I send like them that. something, I can't send the <laughs> yeah. So if I can't, if I, you know, there's a you have a drop ship a kit. A, crew and best effort and <laughs> best effort i mean that's how we that's how we think of participants when you get when you do four or five thousand of them you you break them into little columns you know like this is going to be yeah. best effort you know so so a best effort means i can't send you anything i'm going to be dealing with whatever you have there how do i work with that and so one of the things that we do is uh, we change the angle talk into a corner not into a wall so so we get them to rotate just a little bit because the oh, the yeah, you want to think about every flat surface as a mirror for audio, it's just it's just like having a mirror. And so what you don't want is to if you see yourself if you if you're audio you know in an audio way if you see yourself it means that it's reflecting back into the mic. So turn at a corner so that it, it it's a more complex uh, reflection. And then also we try to get people if we're if it's really important and it's best effort. A lot of times what we'll do is we'll put up, we'll, hey, do you got any blankets? Like literally blankets in the closet or towels. Yeah. Just hang them up. Build a pillow fort in your hotel room. I'm, in my office right now, I have a, <laughs> a fort. You know, like yeah. I, I, and what I did is I literally went to the, I, I mean, mine is not high end. It's moving blankets with, uh, I've got moving blankets in certain places and I bought a couple $30 stands you know that are you know that you buy on amazon from newer or whatever near new how do you i've say never it? even it's tried like newer, to say it out loud knee, one of those newer, words newer <laughs> and uh and then I, I went to the hardware store and i bought a bunch of uh one inch pipe and i screwed it all together and built right. a little grid for like 100 bucks yeah i have a very similar setup in, in here as well just hanging sound blankets it makes your studio look pretty ugly but it works a lot better than anything else i had a horrible room to, to record and I was like I cannot do anything here especially now that things are picking up without being able to dampen this echo so I just ordered a bunch of stuff on Amazon and spent a day putting it up and now it's better I don't say I wouldn't say it's great but it's better but I'd suggest taking these steps no matter how small of a creator you feel like you are like for very average people those basic steps like get the mic closer don't right. talk into a flat uh, hard wall put something soft in front of you those are always worth it, no matter how little effort you want to put into this. Yeah. Still do, do those few things because it'll make such a huge difference for your audience. They will always appreciate it. I'm amazed that, you know, we, we think about it, even if you're doing this just for work, I don't, I mean, I show up well lit most of the time, <laughs> yeah. even for- Sit in front of a window. Yeah. 
you know, like, but, but I'm just saying you want to think about how people perceive you and, and mm -hmm. they may not expect it, but when it's clean, like for instance, I won't use, we have a culture of not using conference call, I mean, not using speaker phones. So we won't like it. So for a decade, we maybe used a speakerphone like 10 times out of six calls a day. We're on six 25 minute calls a day for a decade. And we maybe used it a handful of times. And the reason for that is I want people to understand what I'm saying. I don't, I want them to think about what I'm saying, not trying Absolutely. to understand what I said. And it's like, you know, you know, I think that, uh, you know, the devil created speaker phones to yeah. slow down the human development. So in my last office, I went through a lot of effort trying to set something better up because we would have a situation where about, you know, half of the people in the call were all in one room talking into one microphone in the middle of a big table. And then everybody else was calling in from their laptops. And why is it, it shouldn't be the situation where you can hear all the remote people perfectly, you know exactly what they're saying, but then right. the CEO is sitting at this big boardroom table and everybody's leaning into their laptops, trying to hear what they're saying. They have no idea. And when yeah. everyone's spending all that effort trying to understand what you're saying, what they're not thinking about is they're not comfortably creating with you and thinking about what you're saying. Yeah. They're just, they're just, they're, they're getting every third word. It is crazy. And, and, and the insurer actually makes a really good system for that, which is their microflex, which is not a super affordable thing, but it literally has a little clip on that just feeds into their system so that the CEO can just That's what we clip it on. <laughs> yeah. So you just clip it on and then, and then they sound amazing. Right. And I didn't, I saw it at, I was at a corp, large corporate headquarters and I saw how they just plugged it in and you plugged it in, you push a button and it resets them all. And it's all over Dante and it's really easy to use. And they all work together. And I was like, what is this? You know, and, and it was just amazing. And they go, oh yeah, this is the only way to do conference calls. And so all the same rules apply to what you just said is get that mic near people, yeah. get them, make sure that they can understand it and understand. Like, so when we, when you talk to us, people always notice that we, you know, not always notice, but sometimes notice that our audio was really good. We'd be sitting around the table. There'd be four of us in a conference call you know, and there's four of us in the call, we're not using, we're literally muting and unmuting and talking, mm -hmm. but we are, and we got really good at it. So we could all sit in the same room and just sit there and, and talk. And, and the other thing you have to get good at is, so little things, obviously make sure that you're well lit, get the mic closer and use the mute, 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 mute. If you're not talking, you mute right. always, you know, and, and people get really, really lazy about that. And unless if you're not talking all the time or, or talking frequently, mute because you have no idea what's going to happen around you and you have no idea how much garbage you're throwing into the system, you know, and, and, and so it's just a it's it's a, an incredible tool that is vastly underused. Yeah, I think we've all been in those conference calls where some, you're trying to track down the lawnmower or the barking dog yeah. and nobody admits to it for two minutes until they finally hit the and then, switch, and then it mysteriously disappears yeah because someone goes but, oh that was me this is something i've been thinking about in the last few days is is there, there's a lot of people out there that uh, when they're dealing with something like this they will start saying that you know I, i'm not really a tech person like i don't really like to get into this kind of thing it, i you know the, the kind of person that um is sees their cell phone as a, a challenge and that they don't want to go through the effort of really learning how to tackle it. Now is the time for everybody to stop having some of those fears because it's going to be much more important to be really comfortable with streaming, to be able to uh, trouble fix your computer on your own. I mean, all these little things are super valuable right now. It's how you present yourself. It, yeah. You know, if, if you got a job in corporate America and you said, well, I really don't know how to dress up. Yes, you know, I don't, exactly. I, I only know how to wear shorts. I don't know how to tie my shoes. <laughs> I don't really know how to how to do that, so I'm just not going to because I don't really understand it. No, you go you go online and you start studying and you start figuring out like what should I wear and what 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 makes sense. And the first yeah. day you're there, you look at other people and you go, how do I make it as good or better than theirs? And you and you try because that's going to make you stand out and 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 it's going to at least have you fit in. Within a week of putting that effort in, you will figure it out. It's not the basics aren't that hard. It's hard to do it at your level to be an Alex Lindsay. I think it's going to take years of training, but we can all make big improvements pretty quickly just by following some, you can make, so there's, tips. yeah, there's, there's best practices that we've talked about. There is getting an external, the next step after best practices is getting a great mic and understanding how to use it. You know, whether that's a USB mic or one with an interface, the next step is getting a better webcam, you know, and I, I personally like the, Logitech C920s and the stream cams. I'm, I have a stream cam is like my backup to the main cam that I'm using right now. There is, uh, so those are, those are getting good cameras. Then the next step is getting some lighting so that you can, so that you, you, you look good. There's, there, there are these like kind of steps that you kind of move forward, but all of that, if you get 
a good USB mic, and you get a good stream cam. You are going to spend some money. You don't have to do it tomorrow. But mm -hmm. if you're in a corporate environment, you want to move forward and you want people to hear you, these are things you. I would spend five. I, mean, I have spent more than five hundred dollars on a suit. You know, and and the thing is, is this is your suit. If you're at home, mm -hmm. your 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 video camera, your your audio, and your lighting is your suit. That is how people are interacting with you because you can wear shorts. You know, below your shoulder, yeah, everything below yeah. your shoulder doesn't matter. But you do need to. Uh, you do need to figure out a way that you're going to look good and be presentable and 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 stand out and and those are that's a five hundred for five hundred dollars, you can get all of those things and look dramatically better than everyone around you and who 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 doesn't want to be competitive? I have a good tip that is equivalent to ironing your shirt properly. Uh, that some people may not think about is the audio that is coming out of your computer or your phone, whatever. Like the. Uh, the, the speakers are adding a lot of audio to the situation that your microphones are trying to intelligently deal with. Sometimes they right. really struggle. So a great example is people will put their phone down so that the bottom of it is on a hard surface. And it's, this is very, I mean, it's natural right. to do that. You want to point it at yourself. So you put it on a table, leaning against a, a book or a wall. Then the audio coming out of it starts to bounce right back into those microphones and the computer right. needs to struggle a lot more to try to filter it out. So try to reduce the amount of sound coming out of the device so that it doesn't feed back in as yep. much. If you are, uh, you know, don't turn your speakers up all the way because now that will start to occasionally start to bleed back into the overall conversation. Be aware of what your machine is actually putting out into the world because some of it might be coming back into the overall conversation as well. It's the same yep, reason no, like, absolutely. When, when we record like this, we're wearing headphones because otherwise we'd hear this crazy echo that would be intolerable. Yeah, and, and I have, you know, and, and I take that, I take my headphones pretty seriously. I have, uh, you know, you can get for 40, 40 some dollars, you can buy an auto head, you know, earpiece. This is, this one's a big, a nicer one. The one yeah, that for, I have For anybody here not is, uh, watching the video, you can't tell that Alex has a headphone in at all. <laughs> yeah. yeah so, so I'm using an audio implements, uh, uh, headset, which is pretty much the standard for broadcast. So it's not, and I just have one in my bag, you know, you just throw it on, throw it in because now the other one that I use, um, is the ear heroes, which are literally, you can't hear, you can't hear, you can't see someone have them. This is, I actually uh, walked up to, I was working on a high, um, uh, high security event and I walked up to secret service, one of the secret service guys and I can I, can I ask you a question? And he's like, what do you want to know? Like, he was like looking at me like, I, you know, why are you distracting me from my job? Yeah, yeah. I said, what are your headsets? And then he got really excited. He's like, oh, I use your heroes and blah, 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 blah. And, and, right. and, and, and so these are like thin, like little wires that go in and they are just a standard connection. But they, again, they are, they're great little um, headsets and they look super, uh, they're super low key. And I, I like not looking like I'm wearing stuff. In fact, I don't. Usually, I, I didn't worry about it with us because I wanted to really make sure that the audio was great. But a lot of times, I'll try to push this mic just a little below my head level so that you don't even see it. And the idea is to have a great, you know, great audio and and have it feel like a broadcast. And of course, because I came out of broadcast, you have that sensitivity. I think you can get away with it. The first thing I would do is, number one, is get the headset on, but really move on to some kind of headset that is in-ear and get over the, the whole over the over-the-ear headsets that you see a lot of people use the gamers use and that makes sense for them um not not great for again putting your foot your best foot forward we just want to think about in a virtual world all these things we're doing how the how the mic looks how the earpiece works how the lighting works how the camera works this is our suit this is our our way of looking good whether, whether it's a suit or it's a whatever we do but it's how we fit into that and and how professional we look and how effective we look and, and those things are important and i think that a lot of people are, are just learning that that's all you know it's like and, and a person and a lawyer what i find funny is is that you know my father's a lawyer and a lawyer that you know and he spends a lot more than 500 dollars on his suits and but it is hard to have you know to understand that that now and he doesn't spend a lot of time doing video so he doesn't worry about it but as we move forward there is this if you're going to be out there, you know, having a suit that looks good is, is really important. I think a few weeks ago, this was really a conversation for a narrower group of enthusiasts and nerds. And uh, I think that it's really quickly expanding to something that everybody either should or, or, or could be interested in. You know, unfortunate, unfortunately, one of the things that's important from this perspective is, is that unfortunately, we're going to have a really high unemployment rate yeah. coming up soon. 
you know, this is not going to, it's not going to be in the United States. It's not going to be three and a half percent. It's going to be 20, Absolutely. you know, it's going to be 15 or 20%. And you're going to be out there interviewing with folks and you want to think about these kinds of skill sets and, and whether, you know, putting your best foot forward, because a lot of this is going to be over video. You know, they're not going to be able to have you in. And especially now when things start to recover, they're not, they're not going to want a lot of people coming in and out of the office. That, yeah. that, it's going that, to take a while to ramp back up to what it was. And so when you, you know, thinking about how you look and how you sound is going to make a, it's going to make a difference. And you're going to want every edge that you could have in the same way that you would dress up for an interview. You want to, this is the technological version of dressing up for an interview. No, it really is. Um, if people are looking for more info, I mean, I've always appreciated following you on Twitter because you post helpful stuff there. If somebody is looking for some consulting information or wants to hire you, where should they reach out to you? Yeah, just you, you can uh, go to 090 Media. So uh, 090.media is the is is where i'm uh, i'm director of or head of operations i always say director but head of operations all right well thanks for all the info alex i i appreciate it and i think everybody else does too